So afternoon, everyone. Um, so following on from uh, Lucy Crompton Reed's fantastic talk this morning, I'm going to start my presentation with a definition taken from Wikipedia. Um, so Wikipedia defines a community of interest or interest-based community as a community of people who share a common interest or passion. These people exchange ideas and thoughts about the given passion, but may know or care little about each other outside of this area. These groups are not normally defined by a particular place or geographical area. They can provide a space where people spend extended periods of time. Often they can entail debate, conversation, and exchange of information. In other words, as Wikipedia puts it, a community of interest is a gathering of people assembled around a topic of common interest. And I'll have to admit that I'm a recent convert to the value of Wikipedia and its importance in raising the profile of your collections. Uh, recent attendance at a JISC training course led me to the realisation that the absence of information from or about the University of Stirling archives on Wikipedia has resulted in a huge gap in our visibility to researchers. Um, this is something which we are now beginning to address and I have a lot more to think about following Lucy's talk this, this, this morning. Um, and Wikipedia is a community of interest we have until now ig ignored. But um, today I want to take a look outside our reading rooms, the traditional focus of an archive service, to look at how patterns of use and methods of engagement with archives are changing. Drawing on a number of recent projects at the University of Stirling, I want to look at the challenges of creating new audiences, both physical and virtual, for your collections, highlighting the value of connection and collaboration. So this image here on the title page of my presentation comes from the University of Stirling's own archives, and it's probably the, a photograph of the last time the university campus saw a huge mobilization of students and staff, which was uh, in 1981 uh, in protest against uh, proposed government cuts to funding which threatened the future of, of the university at the uh, time. Uh, 2017 marks the 50th anniversary of the opening of the University of Stirling, and the University of Ar Archives have been involved in a range of events and activities throughout the year. And again, another photograph from our University Archive Collection, uh, Charity Week fundraising taken up at Stirling Castle in 1969. Um, the staff and students of the university provide our core community, but even within this clearly defined group, there's a number of separate elements which can be identified, each with particular needs and interests. Our students provide a constant but ever-shifting presence. Each cohort is physically present on campus for a set number of years, but then disperses around the world. At the last count, the university was home to students from 120 different countries. For the students currently engaged in study at Stirling, we provide a range of opportunities for learning, study, and professional development in the university archives. Following graduation, many of this diaspora of Stirling alumni retain their interest in the university, and the untapped potential of this community is something that I'll return to later. Our staff can also be subdivided in a similar way to our students. The University Archives provides a working resource for current staff, as both as an institutional memory for administrative staff and as a repository of research opportunities for academics. On retirement, many former members of staff are keen to continue to have links with the university. In recent years, a very active and successful retired staff association has been founded, and the University Archives has worked with this group on an oral history project recording memories of working and studying at Stirling. The group has recorded over 100 interviews so far, which have been deposited with the University Archives, and they've created a website to provide access to this material as part of the university's 50th anniversary celebrations. So in preparing for this talk, um, I tried to visualize how, how our most popular collections are used and trying to illustrate the balance between physical use in the reading room and other ways of engaging with the collections outside the archive. Um, so blue is use in the reading room and yellow is outside the archive reading room. And all, all archivists in the audience could probably do something similar with their collections. And it was quite a useful exercise in mapping our current activity and our pri priorities. Um, and kind of thinking about this, um, I recently attended an ARA Scotland uh, workshop on, on the Explore Your Archives campaign. Um, and the vast bulk of the discussion at the event was about um, social media and online use for, for Explore Your Archive events rather than physical events that were taking place in archive services. Again, an, another indication of the way things are, things are changing. 
So just to briefly talk, talk through what I have here, um, at the very top of the table, we have um, our NHS Fort Valley Archive, which is a well-catalogued collection of hospital records popular with family historians who like to come in person to the reading room to carry out genealogical research. Uh, in total contrast to that, we have our Peter Mackay Archive, which is a collection of international interest, which I'll come back to later. You can see how engagement with these collections differs. Um, as I mentioned, the university's 50th anniversary has resulted in a marked increase in the use of the institution's own records, both for reference and research in the reading room and in exhibitions and events across the campus and on social media. We have also have well-catalogued collections with established academic audiences, such as our film collections, including the Lindsay Anderson Archive and the Musicians' Union Archive, which bring researchers from around the world to our reading room. Finally, in this uh, illustration here, we have the Commonwealth Games Scotland Archive, which is one of the largest sporting heritage collections in, in, in Scotland. Now, it's, it's only been used by a handful of uh, researchers at Stirling. However, it's probably our most seen collection with thousands of people around Scotland engaging with the archive. And they've, they've, they've done that through our touring exhibition, Hosts and Champions, mm -hmm. Scotland in the Commonwealth Games, which began life as a small pop-up display at the Glasgow 2014 Games. Since then, with the support of Legacy 2014 funding, it's grown into a large touring exhibition, which to date has visited 12 towns across Scotland, recently returning from Lerwick in the Shetland Islands, and it continues to tour the country with dates confirmed for 2018 for the borders and Glasgow. So for most visitors to the exhibition, that's the limit of their engagement with, with the Commonwealth Games Scotland Archive, but that's fine, isn't it? Um, their experience of the archive is different, but just as important and valid as that of the researcher in the reading room. The attendance figures for the exhibition have been very impressive, but as Geoffrey Crossick outlined earlier in his, in his keynote, we probably need to do more to measure the value of these visits. We need to add additional evidence somewhere between the bare attendance figures we have for the various venues that the exhibition visited and the very nice comments that we have in the visitor's book. Um, and we um, can, however, point to some concrete examples of the benefits to our archive service of this promotional tour. Um, I'd, I'd argue that these developments wouldn't have occurred if the use of the collection was limited to the occasional visitor to the reading room. So firstly, the success of the exhibition um, has highlighted the value of its own heritage to Commonwealth Games Scotland. And they've increasingly put the archive at the core of their current events, uh, such as the recent visit of the Queen's Baton for the 2018 Commonwealth Games to Scotland. Um, secondly, it's also provided an opportunity for educational visits and projects for the venues who have hosted the exhibition. Um, and one, one um, example of that was uh, Dum Dumfries Museum, who, uh, as, as you see here, hosted sessions, but also pr produced a feature for a, a local on online television channel which is a wonderful three-minute promotional film for the archive and the exhibition, which we had nothing to do with, but we're delighted to see someone else doing it for us. Um, and thirdly, the increased visibility of the exhibition has also led to the growth of the archive through the donation of Commonwealth Games memorabilia by visitors to the exhibition. This includes some substantial donations of material from the families of former sporting administrators and competitors. And this material that's been added to the archive is fantastic because it fills in the gaps in the official record. There's quite a lot in the personal collections of people who visited various Commonwealth Games around the world and brought lots of uh, memorabilia back from those games. <clears throat> and in parallel with the touring exhibition, we've posted regular updates on social media using the hashtag Hosts and Champions. Um, we, and we became aware of a parallel audience for the exhibition on Twitter when we received a donation from a Canadian follower of these three mascots here, which basically complete, completed our full set of Commonwealth Games mascots. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a proud boast to have for any, for any collection. Um, and this, this guy here, the big bear, it was the very first Commonwealth Games. I could give a separate talk on Commonwealth Games ma mascots, but I won't. Um, the first mascot was the official mascot from 1978, but it basically means for the exhibition we have a full set and they're now 
a permanent feature of the touring exhibition. Uh, for the rest of the talk, um, I'd like to concentrate on uh, a recent addition to the University Archives and what, what we've done with them, the personal papers of Peter Mackay. Um, Peter Mackay was the, was the son of a Scottish family from the town of Dune, just north of Stirling, and he abandoned the promising military career in 1947, having risen to the rank of captain in the Scots Guards. He emigrated to southern Rhodesia to become a tobacco farmer, but soon became involved in the anti-colonial independence movements which were sweeping Southern Africa, working as a journalist and writer. His important contribution to the struggle for independence was noted by the African historian Terence Ranger, who described him as an unknown hero. Ranger also described the importance of Mackay's personal archive, writing that, one hopes that Peter's own papers will become available. They have survived all his migrations about Central and East Africa and they have survived the repeated burglaries which his bungalow in Marondera, Zimbabwe, has suffered. Peter Mackay died at his home in Zimbabwe in 2013, and his family took his wishes into account and ensured his archive was donated to the University of Stirling. And huge thanks must go to Peter's nephew, Rupert, who travelled from London uh, to Zimbabwe to organise the packing and transport of the archive. And this photo here is... Uh, the archive all packed up ready for its, its long journey to uh, Stirling. And the collection arrived in Stirling in April 2014 in 28 large crates, trunks and filing cabinets. Uh, the collection provides a comprehensive record of Mackay's journalism, political activism, travel, photography and charity work. His journals, notebooks, correspondence and papers preserve a detailed account of his life as a writer and political activist while the large collection of photographs taken by Mackay during his travels around Southern Africa provide a stunning visual record of a continent during a period of great change. So I'll just provide you a brief overview of the content of, of the archive. Uh, it includes over 60 years of, of correspondence beginning in 1948, with many of the key political figures of the period, in particular those involved in the independence movements in M Malawi and Zimbabwe. Um, his, his work as a journalist is also reflected. Full sets of publications that he contributed to as editor or, or as, a, as a journalist, including Concord, which was the journal of the Interracial Association of, of Southern Rhodesia from the 1950s, and Sopano, an anti-colonial magazine he published in what was then known as Ny Nyasaland, um, which I've, I've since learned from some academics was previously unavailable to uh, researchers. It was very difficult to find copies of this, this, this uh, journal. Um, not every publication Peter Mackay worked on actually sur sur survives. Um, the journal Chapupu, which he edited, was banned by the Southern Rhodesian government in 1962. And for his safety and that of the other contributors to the, to the journal, uh, Mackay destroyed all the copies of Chapupu in his possession but he, he made sure to record the process, uh, and we have this record of it in uh, the archive. But at the heart of the collection is uh, an extensive photographic collection, over 3,000 prints and negatives providing visual record of Mackay's life in Africa and his political activities. Um, everything from being on a safari in Kenya in 1957 to photographs of the 1961 Nyasaland election campaign and the first meetings of the Malawi Conference Party, to images documenting the economic development and growth across the subcontinent. Uh, and these buildings here weren't, as I first thought, the University of Stirling, because they look exactly like our buildings, but it's the, it's the University of Zambia taken in 1970, the exact same time when, um, when the University of Stirling buildings were being built. So face, face with this wealth of material, our main challenge was how to make this collection available to an international audience. We couldn't rely on our traditional methods to achieve our aims for the collection. It wasn't one of our core collections. We didn't have funding to support it. All our focus, as I'd earlier mentioned, was on the university's 50th uh, anniversary ce celebrations. So our challenge was to identify an audience that might be interested in the, in the collection and then successfully connect with them. So in the, in the autumn of 2016, we developed a crowdfunding campaign with the university's fundraising team. It was the first time the university had tried crowdfunding, and we were happy to be partners in this pilot project. For the university archives, the project provided the opportunity to open up this new collection 
of international importance through a program of cataloging and digitization. And for the university's fundraisers, it fed into their strategy of innovative fundraising, aiming to engage with alumni in new ways. The wide reach of the archive, wide international reach of the archive made it a suitable candidate for crowdfunding, with a key ambition of the project being to make the collection available to as wide an audience as possible, particularly in Africa, through a program of di digitization. At a time when heritage budgets are being stretched and competition for grants and awards is fierce, this project showed how crowdfunding can provide additional alternative ways of obtaining support for cataloging and digitization. Uh, one, one key decision that we made at the start of the campaign was to choose the most appropriate crowdfunding platform for the project because there are a lot of different crowdfunding platforms out there. And our fundraising team selected Crowdfunder UK as being the most popular platform for the charity and university sectors. And also there was the fact that um, the additional attraction of a new partnership with the Heritage Lottery Fund who are offering 25% match funding for heritage projects on Crowdfunder. So we, uh, we, were, we were able to tap into that too. <clears throat> um, the funding that we sought for the, for the crowdfunding appeal was to cover the cost of digitization of selected material from the collection. However, digitization on its own does not equal access. Uh, and without our own in-house digital content management system, we had to investigate ways of making this material accessible and available to key audiences. So before launching the campaign, we secured agreement with JSTOR, the digital library suppliers, to host our new digital content on their Struggles for Freedom website which is a resource freely available to researchers across Africa through JSTOR's access, uh, African Access Initiative Programme. And that agreement put in place a key promotional aspect of the campaign, which was support to open up the archive to international audiences. Um, basically, it's just a quick illustration of the, of the campaign web page. Um, one key point to keep in mind is your project should include work that makes, a, that makes a visible difference to your collection, something you can promote and share to demonstrate the value of the com contributions you have received from, from people. The, the project was launched on Giving Tuesday in November 2016, an annual social media event at the end of November, and I think uh, to, today is, is Giving Tuesday for, for 2017, and it was an eight-week eight project which entailed extensive uh, social media and promotional work. Our fundraising team engaged with our um, uh, alumni community around the world, was left to the university archives to investigate other contacts, uh, contacts and it was a case of tweet, tweet and tweet again. Um, the benefit of choosing the right hashtags was really important about getting your message out there, constantly updating people about, you know, hitting milestones on the project is important too. You've got to keep, keep the campaign fresh and keep sending new messages out. Um, this is just a very simple illustration of the benefit of um, using Twitter for projects like this and um, getting your partners and supporters to spread the message for you. So for the minimum of effort from your supporters brings maximum exposure for your, for your message. Um, through um, using hashtags, we, we have found uh, Twitter accounts like Black History Heroes who have 35,500 followers who were supporting the campaign and retweeting our messages. The crowdfunding uh, uh, website themselves would support it. Also, our partners, Towns Web Archiving, who were doing the digitization, they, they, they uh, promoted the, our fundraising campaign too. Uh, so, I'm pleased to say that uh, at the end of January 2017, we um, did it. We successfully raised the 8,000 pounds we'd aimed, actually I raised it a little bit more, um, with 64 supporters over a period of 56 days. And that money has uh, enabled work to begin on the cataloging and digitization of this important new archive with um, a key selection of publications and photographs having been digitized by Townsweb Ar Archiving. So just to, just to finish up, um, Basically, just, just to make the point that we should ce celebrate the success of projects like this. And uh, this in infographic here basically summarizes uh, the su success of the project. Um, we uh, entered into the Herald Higher Education Awards, which was an award, uh, awards organized by the, the Glasgow Herald newspaper. And we got special commendation for campaign of, of uh, the year for the, for the project. Um, and um, basically, the project has, shows how digitization and social media 
can be utilised to open up access to the collection. We, uh, but we haven't forgotten that the physical collection at Stirling is also a unique resource for our local community of students. And over the last couple of months, a group of students um, have spent long hours in the reading room preparing an exhibition of material from the archive, a physical accompaniment to the digital resources soon to be made available via JSTOR. So having found my way back to the reading room, I think I'll stop there. So thank you. <laughs>